Hello everyone, this is Chai from the Bloomingdale Public Library, and today we will be discussing using loops and arrays while programming in Ruby. You'll see loops and arrays implemented in most of the major popular programming languages, and each of these topics probably deserves their own video. However, I figure loops and arrays go together so well, and I don't intend on going too far beyond the basics that I'd cover them both in the same video. And we're going to start with arrays. So what is an array? According to the Ruby documentation, arrays are ordered, integer indexed collections of any object. In other words, arrays are objects for holding multiple other objects. In other more stricter languages like Java and C++, you'll usually see arrays restricted to a specific type. In other words, you could only have an array of integers or an array of strings but in Ruby, you get to mix and match. Objects within an array are referred to as elements, and each element will have a position in the array. These positions start at zero and then count up by one, no fractions. For an example, the first element of an array named AR would be AR and then a zero in brackets. So that number in the brackets indicates the index. The third element of this array would be AR, and then a two in brackets. And that might not be intuitive, but remember you have to account for zero holding the first spot. You can also have negative indexes or indices, both are grammatically correct. And they can be used to refer to elements starting from the end of the array, starting at negative one. So in other words, the last element of our array would be AR and then negative one in brackets. And the second to last would be AR, negative two, etc. An element with an unassigned value or an out of bounds index will return nil. I kind of don't like how there isn't a way to discern between an unassigned element and an element that is out of bounds. However, there's some ways we can guard against that and we'll go over them. Stricter languages will typically give you an error if you go out of bounds. Okay, so let's start laying down some code. If you needed help installing Ruby, or getting your setup to look like what I've got here, or just understanding what these windows are all about, I'd recommend you go back into our channel and look for a video called Introduction to Ruby, and that will get you all caught up. In the meantime, we're going to go ahead and create some arrays. There's a couple of ways to do that. Probably the simplest way is to come up with a nice original name for your array and set it equal to empty brackets. What that will do is create a new array called AR with no elements to it. So it's an object with no objects inside of it, which by itself isn't particularly helpful, but it does set up the array to be used later in your code. If you want to see what's going on inside your array, you can go ahead and use puts and then put the name of your array in parentheses, and it will put each element of the array on its own line in the output window. So I'm gonna go ahead and save it, run it. And sure enough, there are no elements in the array, so there are no lines of output. You might recall that if you use P instead of puts, you'll get a little bit more information. It's more useful for debugging. I'll save that, run that, You'll see in this case, you do see the empty brackets indicating the empty array. So there's another instance where P is particularly useful, and we'll get to that in just a sec. I'm going to set this back to puts. Let's say we wanted to actually create a new array with something already in it. All you got to do is put in the new object values delimited by commas. And again, these are their own objects. They're just referred to with the array and an index number. So you can add, subtract, multiply, divide. Um, I don't instinctively mix and match my object types within arrays, but you can do that in Ruby. So just to demonstrate, I'll include a string in here. And you can do anything to this string that you would normally. So you know, check its length, concatenate it with another string, etc. Go ahead and save it, run it, and there you go. 
again, each element on its own line. Now let's say you initialized your array in such a way where you have a nil value in there. In that case, I'm going to save it, run it, and the nil value actually creates a blank line. That's how Ruby prints its nils. That might be unhelpful or maybe even misleading during debugging, in which case, especially if you know you have nils in your array, you might want to use the P instead. Save it, run it, and again, you get the other kind of notation, but this time you can see we've got a nil in there. So again, using P for debugging arrays can be particularly helpful if you know you have nil values. Now there's another way to initialize a new array, and that's a little bit more explicit. So what you do is do array, capitalized, dot new. So when I say explicit, I mean you can tell pretty much exactly what we're really doing here. And that is, we are calling the, well, the initialize method for the array object. For some reason, whenever you see a dot new, you're actually calling a method called initialize. And that's just a little nuance of Ruby. So anytime you do that with an object, you're calling the initialize method. And if there's no arguments, you can go ahead and just leave it as is. I personally like having the parentheses to indicate a method just so I know that it's there. But either way will work. We'll go ahead and do puts, save it, run it. And just like before, again, you get a blank array. Use P, save it, run it. You get the empty brackets. So this initialize method that we call with dot new can accept a couple of arguments in the case of the array. If we put in one argument, that will indicate how many new elements we create, and they'll all be initialized with nil. So again, I'm going to use puts and run this. And as you might expect, you get three blank lines. Do P instead, save it, run it, and you can see our three nil objects. Now, I don't particularly like that it initializes to nil by default. And just to show you an example of why, we'll go ahead and check out what is in the first element of our array. Save it run it, and you should see, sure enough, it's nil, as you'd expect. But when, if we were to check what is in the 100th position, which we have not actually created, save it, run it, and in both cases, it returns nil. And again, this might throw you off in debugging or might just completely screw up your program. One of the ways you can guard against that is by using the second argument of the initialize method for array. And we'll go ahead and throw a comma in there. And we'll say, um, let's initialize to just a dash. So that's a good indicator that there is an element, but there's nothing assigned. So in that case, we'll go ahead, delete all this up. We'll do puts, save it, run it. You see we get three dashes, sure enough. We do P, save it, run it. Same thing that you might expect. And now, if we were to check what's in the first element of the AR method, and then check the 100th position, which is not initialized. I'm going to go ahead and save it, come over here and run it. And now you can see one position has the dash, whereas the position we have not created an element for is set to nil. So again, that's a nice way of differentiating between an initialized element with no 
assigned value yet. Well, there's an assigned value, but it's basically a placeholder and a position in the array that has not been actually created. Something you can't do when you're creating new arrays is set an object to something without a value. So if we were to do something like this, so we're setting the array to one element, but that element's name is x, which is basically a, a variable name without a value. Save it, run it. It gives us an error and you see undefined local variable. So that is one thing you cannot do when creating your arrays or even when you're assigning elements within your code. You need to give it an actual value. You can't give it something undefined. So again, just something to be aware of. And now that you've seen what the error is, you'll know to be on your guard for that. So now that you know how to create arrays, it's time to play around with them a bit. First, just to review, if you want to refer to an element in an array, use the name of the array and then the index of the element, remembering that the indices start at zero. So AR1 actually refers to the element in the second position, which in this case is a 20. I also want to emphasize that each element in an array is its own object. So that means you can do object things to them. In this case, AR1 is an integer, so we can call an integer method on it. Say, check if it's even. Sure enough, AR1 is even because it's the number 20. We can also do some arithmetic. Let's say divide by five. Save, run, and if you didn't know, 20 divided by five is in fact four. So again, we're treating AR1 just as if it were a regular integer object. That works for strings as well. So just to show, we'll go ahead and look at AR3, which in this case is hello. And a string method would be something like length. So dot length, save, run, and if you didn't know, hello has five characters. You can also see what happens if you add the string Joe to hello. You get hello Joe, sure enough. So again, just to emphasize, each element in an array is its own object and you can do all the regular object things with them. Let's say you wanted to assign a new value to an element. Go ahead and assign a R1, oops, the value 50. That's all there is to it. If you wanted to add or subtract, what you can do is plus equals and minus equals. This is kind of shorthand but you see it a lot when you're incrementing and decrementing counters in loops. So you'll see a lot of plus equals one and minus equals one. And it's just a shorthand for adding and subtracting. And we'll see it a bunch in the second part of this video. So if I add 50 to AR1, you get 70. And just for completion's sake, we'll try minus equals. And sure enough, you get negative. 30. Now just because AR1 currently holds an integer object doesn't mean you can't assign it another type of object. So if you like, we can go ahead and assign it a string. Let's say by. Save and run. And Ruby does not have a problem with that. Now I talked earlier about how if you were to refer to an element in an array that hasn't been created yet, you get the nil object returned. And I don't really care for that functionality because I think it lends itself to some hard to track errors. And the reverse is the same. So if you were to assign a value to an, an element that hasn't been created yet, you get some functionality that I don't particularly care for again. So I'm going to go ahead and let's say we made a 
blunder here and we held down the one key a couple times. So now we're going to assign AR111 to buy, even though we're only up to four. So I'm going to print out the whole array. I'm going to use the P option so we can see the nils because there's going to be a lot of them. So what happens is if you assign an element that hasn't been created yet, every position up to that index gets assigned a nil object, which in most cases probably isn't what you intend. Now it does offer a little bit of extra flexibility, but again, it's not functionality that I particularly care for. And I think it's just something you have to be aware of and be on your guard for. So there's one other thing I want to look at in this section, and that's doing array arithmetic. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new array. We'll call it array three. And we're just going to add the full arrays, AR and names. So I'm not referring to any elements here. I'm actually using the whole arrays. And we'll see what happens here. Save and run. And you'll see it actually just adds all the elements of one to all the elements of the other. You can also subtract arrays as well. I wonder if you can guess what will happen if I subtract names from AR. Save, run. And what it did was subtract any element that appears in the names array from the AR array. In this case, it was just the name Amy. So we subtracted names from AR, and as a result, you don't see the name Amy show up when I print out the array. So that's just some things you can do with arrays. I'm going to skip covering the concept of multidimensional arrays for today. Basically, multidimensional arrays are just array objects comprised of more array objects. And they're useful for creating tables of data or referring to squares in the grid of something like a board game. But I'm going to leave that for you to research on your own. And instead, we're going to finish up our discussion on arrays by covering some of the methods that we can call on them. For this section, I'm going to take out the parentheses that I usually use when I'm sending things to output. So instead, I'm going to do something like this. So P, A, R without the parentheses. And if I save and run that, you can see it works just like it did with the parentheses. And this is just to make things a little bit more clear when I start uh, calling methods which have parentheses of their own. I don't want things to get stacked up and confusing. So we're going to start off by calling the first method. When you do that, you use period, first, and that should give us the first element of the array. Sure enough, it's a 10, and 10 is at the beginning of the AR array. As you might guess, we can also check for the last element as well. And because there's no arguments, you can leave the parentheses out of the method if you like. I like putting them in there just to make it more clear that you're calling a method. So I'm going to leave it in. And sure enough, we get Amy, who is at the end of the AR array. If you wanted to figure out how many elements are in your array, you can call length. And again, the parentheses are optional. When I save and run that, you see we get the answer of five. And sure enough, there are five elements in the array. You can also call size instead. Size is an alias for length. So they both call the same method. You can use whichever one you like. And that'll be the case for a couple of other methods as well. So if I save and run it, again, we get five. If you wanted to check if an array is empty or not, you can call empty with a question mark. Save and run. No, the array is not empty because there's five things in there. And if you wanted to search if a particular element is in there, you can do include 
again with the question mark. And then we can see if Amy is in there. Oops. Save and run. She sure is. What if we looked for Joe? And Joe is not in there. Sure enough, he is not. So the next bunch of methods I'm gonna cover are for adding and removing things from an array. And we're gonna start with push. So what happens if we push Joe? In this case, we're just gonna push him. And instead of sending that to output, we're gonna output the whole array. So we can see what the array looks like after we push Joe. And as you can see, we added them to the end of the array. So pushing an element puts it at the end of the array. You can also use append. Append is an alias for push. You can also use this method to add more than one. So if you wanted to push Joe and Jill, save and run. Sure enough, Joe and Jill are added to the end of the array. The opposite of push is pop. So what I'm going to do is do AR pop. And what that will do is return the last element in the array, and it will also remove it. So it removes and returns the last element in an array. So if I were to save and run, we get Amy. So we popped Amy. So instead of printing what's returned by pop, instead I'm going to print the array instead. So we're going to pop the AR array and then print it. And when I do that, you see Amy is missing because we popped her. On the other side of things, we have unshift and shift. So unshift is basically the flip side of push. So instead of adding things to the end of the array, we add them to the beginning. So we'll go ahead and unshift Joe. Save and run. And sure enough, when we I'll put the array after unshifting Joe. You see Joe is stuck to the beginning of the array. And just like push, you can add multiple values as well. We're going to leave Jill alone for now. And instead, we're going to go to shift. And shift will remove and return the first element in the array. So we'll go ahead and print what is returned by the method shift. And sure enough, it gives us 10. So it removes 10 and returns it. So we can go ahead and print it out. If we do the AR shift and then print out the AR array, you see 10 is now missing. So after you shift it, you lose what's at the beginning there. And you can also shift more than one value. So let's say we were to shift and then use three as the argument. That will remove and return the first three elements. So let's go ahead and print what's returned by AR shift three. Save and run. And sure enough, we get 10, 20, and 30. So you could assign that whole bunch to another array if you like. If we are to print the array after the shift, sure enough, you see we removed the first three elements. So it removes and returns however many elements you refer to in the argument. All right, two more. And like I said, there's a whole bunch of others that you can go ahead and research your own, research on your own on the Ruby Documents website. But we're gonna finish up with delete at. 
So delete underscore at. And then we'll say two. And then we'll print the array. See if you can guess what happens. There you go. If you look at the array, you'll see that the number 30 is missing. So it removed the element at position two, in which this case it's 30 because remember zero refers to 10, one refers to 20, two refers to 30. You have to remember that an index of zero is what refers to the first position. Last one is insert. And for insert, you refer to a specific position in the array and a value. So once again, we'll insert Joe. And we'll insert him at position two. So save, run, and sure enough, Joe is now element indexed with the number two. So position zero, position one, position two, and you see Joe in the array. So again, just a sample of some of the methods that you can call on an array. There's a whole bunch more, and I recommend you go ahead and do some research and figure out what they all are and what they all do on your own. Time to start talking about loops. So what is a loop? A loop is a block of code that is executed zero or more times based on something like a counter or perhaps once for each element in a collection, and an array is an example of a collection, or whether a Boolean expression evaluates to true or false, and we'll have a look at all of these situations. If the conditions of a loop's Boolean expression are not addressed or addressed improperly, you might wind up in an infinite loop. Now, there are reasons why you'd want to purposely create infinite loops, but typically when you're just starting off, creating an infinite loop is something you do by accident, and it'll mean that your program is running and you cannot stop it without going through the operating system. So typically something to avoid. One last note, a loop is a typical way to iterate through the elements of an array, which is why we're covering these subjects together. So with all that said, let's go ahead and program some loops. We're gonna start off with what I think is one of the easier loops, and that's the times loop. To create a times loop, all you do is put down a number, we'll use six, period, times, space, do. That is the beginning of our loop. Inside of our loop, I'm gonna indent it, and we're just gonna spit out the word yay. And then when you're all done with your loop, the end of the loop just gets the word end. Save, run, and sure enough, we run through the loop six times, spitting out the word yay every time. Just as a note, there is another kind of syntax you can use for a times loop, and that is instead of the word do, you use a left brace, and instead of the word end, you use a right brace. And this is the kind of thing you see in Java and C++, so if it makes more sense to you, you can go ahead and use this syntax instead. I'm gonna save it and run it. And as you can see, it does the same thing. I'm gonna go back and use do and end. So as I said before, using loops is a good way to go through the elements of an array. So let's go ahead and do that with a times loop. So instead of the number six, I'm gonna go ahead and hit AR period, and then call the length method on it. So we'll get the number of elements from our array, dot times, do, and then inside of the loop, we'll go ahead and multiply each element times five and spit it out. So we're gonna do AR, then brackets, and we're gonna need a variable to help us refer to the elements in the array. So for our index, I'm gonna use the word counter. It's 
pretty typical to see people use the letter I, and then if they have loops inside of loops inside of loops, they'll use the letters J, K, and L. But for right now, I'm just gonna use the word counter. You can use whatever makes sense to you. And if you ever have a counter inside a loop, you usually want to initialize it outside of the loop. Otherwise, you're gonna reset the counter each time, and in a lot of cases, that can result in one of those infinite loops. So we're gonna set the counter to zero outside of the loop. And then after we print out our results, we're gonna go ahead and add one to it. So, oh yeah, we were gonna multiply this times five. So I'm gonna do times equals five. So just like the notation down here where we add one by using plus equals, we're gonna multiply and save the results with times equals. So we'll save it, run it, and sure enough, if you multiply 10 times five, you get 50. If you multiply negative five times five, you get negative 25, and so on. So that seems to work. So there you go. That is an example of using a times loop to iterate through the elements of an array. So I think you'll agree that the times loop is pretty simple to learn and use. However, I would probably only use it to perform a certain action a certain number of times, like maybe simulations of a dice roll. If I wanted to do that like a hundred times, that would be a good instance for that. If I actually wanted to traverse the elements of an array, I would probably use a for loop instead. And you can use a for loop to go through the elements of a collection or go through numbers in a range. And we'll start off with going through numbers in a range. So let's go ahead and recreate the loop that we had before. So we're gonna start off with the word for, and then we need a counter variable. This time I'll actually use the letter I and the word in, and we'll go from one to six. So that'll go six times, and then the word do. And this word do is actually optional. You can leave it off and you'll get the same results. Inside the loop, we'll go ahead and do puts. And we'll spit out the word yay again. And at the end of the loop, use the word end again. So this should do just what we did with the first loop that we created with the times loop. So I'll save it, run it, and sure enough, we get six yays. So even though this loop executes the same way as our times loop did, we also have the availability of this counter variable i. And just to demonstrate that, I'm gonna go ahead and put I in there, save it, run it, and you see it counts up by one with each iteration of the loop. So that's kind of nice. It builds the counter into the loop. Let's go ahead and use this counter to do what we did before with our array. So we'll go ahead and do AR, and then brackets, and we're gonna use our counter variable i times equals five, save it, run it, and ooh, we get an error. If we have a look at it here, you see we are multiplying five times nil, and you can't multiply nil by anything, so that's because we're going out of bounds. So. If we look at our array here, you see there's only five elements in there, which means we go from indices zero to four. So let's go ahead and set our range from zero to four. Save it, run it, and we get what we want. So that is how to use four with a range of numbers. Now let's go ahead and use it for traversing an array. And we'll go ahead and keep using our, our first array here. And instead of for i in zero to four do, we're gonna take out the range and we're gonna put in the name of the array. And again, the word do is optional. So for i in ar do, and instead of all of this, I'm just gonna put in the letter i because now i is the element of the array one at a time instead of a counter. 
So I'm going to save it, run it, and we get the same results, except our loop looks a lot cleaner. So again, just to emphasize what we're doing here, I'll replace the counter with the word element. Because that's actually what this is. So for each time through the loop, it's basically doing AR0, then AR1, AR2. So the word element is basically the array and the index combined. It's kind of weird to put together in your head at first, but after you use it a few times, it starts to make sense. So again, with the word element in there, perhaps that makes a little bit more sense. I run it and we get the results that we were expecting. So that is using the for loop for traversing a range of numbers and for going through the elements in an array. Next, we're gonna cover the each loop, which actually functions a lot like the for loop when you use it to traverse an array. So to use an each loop, the first thing you need is the name of the array. In this case, we're gonna use the names array just for a change of pace. So the name of the array, period, then the word each which should indicate to you that we are calling the each method on the names array object. So after each, you do space do, and then space pipe. And to create a pipe character, you hold down shift and then the backslash key, which is right above enter. And inside the pipes, we're going to need a name for our element as we loop through the array. And before I used I and then the word element, I'm just gonna use the word element again to make things extra clear. And then create another pipe. And that is the beginning of our loop. Inside of the loop, we'll go ahead and print each name um, and we'll throw in a little extra so we're not just regurgitating the contents of the array. So we'll do name colon plus element. At the end of the loop, type the word end. I'm going to save it, run it. And there you go. We go through each element of the array and we stick the word name in front of it. So again, functions very much like the for loop. It just looks a little bit differently. Alternatively, you can replace the word do with a left brace and the word end with a right brace. Save it. Run it. Same results. I'm going to put the words back. And now we're gonna have a look at the each with index loop. So to do that, instead of each, we're gonna do underscore with underscore index. So again, this is another method of the array object. So each with index lets us declare an index variable. So we go inside the pipes and after the element variable, we declare an index variable. So something like I might make sense. I'll go ahead and use the full word index, again, just to make things extra clear. And now we can use this variable inside of our loop. So I'm gonna go ahead and we'll just stick it in the string right here. There we go. Save it, run it. And now you can see we've got the indexes thrown in with the element values. So that is how you use the each and each with index loops to traverse an array. Okay, so next up is the while loop. A while loop is a block of code that will execute zero or more times as long as a Boolean expression evaluates to true. And you can do this evaluation either at the beginning of the while loop or the end of the while loop. So let's start off with the beginning and we'll do a pretty common example here. We'll do 
uh, just a regular traversal through the array. So we'll do our counter here. So i equals zero. And then the while loop starts off with while. And then the Boolean expression. So we'll say while i is less than, and we'll do ar dot length. So as long as our counter is less than the total number of elements in the array, we'll do this loop. Again, the word do is optional. And for our code in the loop, let's go ahead and we will multiply times 100 this time. So we'll go ahead and put our counter variable in there. Times equals 100. And at the end of the loop, once again, we use the word end. So save. Run. And you might be able to see the problem already, but if you don't, I forgot to increment the counter. So this is what happens. We get a big, fat, never-ending loop. I'm going to have to close the window and open it back up. Go ahead and increment that counter. Save and run. That's a little better. So as long as this Boolean expression evaluates to true, this loop will keep running. Like I said, you can leave off the do. Save and run same results. So when if we started off with our loop evaluating to false. So let's say i equals 10, which is bigger than the length of the array. Save it, run it. Nothing happens because it skips right over it. So that is the while loop when you're evaluating the Boolean expression at the beginning. Let's try it out by evaluating it at the end. To do that, I'm just going to cut and paste this at the end here. So you have end, while, and then the Boolean expression. At the beginning of the loop, you just have the word begin. So again, this function's pretty much the same, except we don't check our Boolean expression until the end of the loop, which means we're going to go through this loop at least one time. Now usually that's not a big deal. So we'll go ahead and set our counter to zero. Save and run. We get what we'd expect. But when if our Boolean expression starts off false and we don't evaluate to the end of the loop, it means we're gonna go through this loop once and in the case of traversing this array, we're gonna be out of bounds. And when we run that, we get an error that we've seen before where we're trying to multiply nil times a value, which you can't do. So there you go. That is a while loop, evaluating it at the beginning and at the end of the loop. One last loop to cover, and that is the until loop. An until loop is a block of code that executes zero or more times while a Boolean expression evaluates to false. This is literally my definition for a while loop, except I swapped in the word until in place of the word while, and the word false in place of the word true. So with that said, let's go ahead and type up an until loop. You start off with the word until, and then a Boolean expression. In this case, we're gonna look for cal in the names array. So until, names, and we're going to need a variable for our index, we use i, equals cal, do. Do, once again, is optional. So we need to initialize our counter outside of the array, outside of the loop, rather. And then inside the loop, we're just going to increment the counter. So we're going to check to see if we found cal. If we find them, we bail out. If we don't, 
we go through the next iteration of the loop. So we're going to add one to our counter in the loop. And then to close up the loop, you just use the word end. So once our loop ends, we're going to go ahead and report to the user the index that we found cal at. So do puts cal is at index then i period to underscore s to convert it to a string. Let's see what that looks like. It says cal is at index two. If we go to the array, yeah, Amy, Bob, Cal. Sure enough, he is at index two, so that is correct. So this is a nice, cute little until loop evaluating the Boolean expression at the beginning. Let's go ahead and evaluate it at the end. So we're just going to cut that first line and stick it at the end here. So we've got end, until, then the Boolean expression, and I don't believe you can use the word do when you evaluate at the end of the loop. At the beginning of the loop, just type up the word begin. So we'll save it, run it, and sure enough, Cal is still at index two. Now it might not look like it, but this is actually some poorly written code. And to demonstrate why, we're gonna go looking for Amy instead. So we'll save it, run it, and you might not recognize it, but we are caught in a never ending loop. So basically what happened is we went searching for Amy, but we incremented our counter first, which means this is actually names one, which is Bob. So we skipped right over Amy before we even looked for her. So this is just another indication that sometimes it matters whether or not you're checking your Boolean expression at the beginning or the end of the loop. But there you go. That is how you use an until loop. We're going to go through some keywords and then we'll call it a day. So three words I'd like to cover are break, next, and redo. And these words are used to alter the natural flow of code inside a loop. So first thing we're going to need is a loop. Go ahead and create a simple for loop that goes from 1 to 10. And all it's going to do is spit out the counter, just so we can see what's going on. Let's make sure that works first. Looks good to me. So when you're using one of these keywords, you're typically using it inside a conditional statement. In other words, a NIF statement. So for our condition, let's say if i is equal to 5. We'll start with break, since that's probably the one you're going to use the most. So if i equals 5, break. We'll save it, run it, and sure enough, our loop only makes it to 4, and then it breaks out. So that's why you use the break keyword. It's to break out of a loop. And you usually do it if some condition is true. All right, let's try the next keyword. So if i is equal to 5, then next. Save and run. And if you actually look through the numbers here, you see we skipped the number 5. So if we get to 5, we hit the next keyword, and that jumps us to the next iteration of the loop without printing anything out. So next is for going to the next iteration of the loop. Last keyword is redo. Let's save it and run it. And once again, you may not realize it, but we are stuck in a loop.
to explain what's happening is we go through the loop normally, one, two, three, four. Once we hit five, we redo this iteration of the loop. And when we do so, i is still equal to five, so we redo the iteration of the loop. When we do that, i is still equal to five, etc. So typically, if you're gonna redo an iteration of a loop, you want the conditions to be a little different, otherwise you're gonna get stuck. So let's go ahead and change the conditions of the loop. We'll say i equals 100. We'll save that, run that, and our program is able to finish. And if you look at our count here, we go one, two, three, four, and instead of getting stuck on five or printing the number five, we print 100 instead. And then we continue on. So those are the three words, break, next, and redo. And you use those to change the flow of code when you're using a loop. And with that, that is all I had to cover for today. I hope you learned something. I hope you had fun. I hope I've encouraged you to do some experimenting and research on your own. And I hope you have a good day.